Okay, so thank you, uh, Anna, for that introduction. Uh, we would like to thank Anna, Scott, and, and Peter um, for uh, inviting us to talk about our work uh, here today, which is enacting um, imagined conversations as a multimodal strategy in satire. Uh, this is going, this is a work that uh, I collaborated on with Esther and Todd. Uh, and it was a uh, base, it's based on a paper we published last year uh, entitled, Hi, Mr. President, Fictive Interaction Blends as a Unifying Rhetorical Strategy in Satire in the Review of Cognitive Linguistics Journal. Uh, and we welcome everyone to read it if you'd like to know a little bit more about what we're going to talk about today. There are hundreds of satirical news programs worldwide with real or entirely made up stories. They belong to a soft news genre that is said to be a genre blend of information and entertainment. An illustrious example of a soft or parody news program is The Daily Show with its previous host, Jon Stewart. This is an American late night satirical television program on current news stories. Its extreme popularity was reflected in the many awards it won over the years with Stewart as its host. And I'd like to call attention to the Peabody Awards because these are very prestigious awards that are normally given to journalists, uh, serious journalists, not necessarily from satirical news. It has been the object of communication and journalism studies who have focused on topics like whether the show is considered satirical news or reliable journalism, and other studies that have analyzed strategies that the host used to engage his audience. For example, the use of video clips and sound bites from serious news sources, pop culture references, multi-voice strategies, amongst others. The Daily Show with Jon Stewart has influenced a whole generation of satirical political entertainers like Stephen Colbert, Samantha Bee, John Oliver, and even the current host, Trevor Noah. Colbert, Bee, and Oliver were once correspondents when Jon Stewart was the host of The Daily Show, and so their influences are very obvious from Jon Stewart. But the question is, what makes John Stewart so good at using humor to comment on current events? On his show, John Stewart was able to hold politicians and news media figures accountable for their actions by strategically using three rhetorical comic tactics, parodic polyglossia, contextual clash, and satirical specificity. The first, originating from Bakhtin's term polyglossia, refers to the multi-voiced, multi-viewpoint nature of the world. Stewart presented his own perspectives on the news, using various voice registers to convey different politically and culturally relevant information, a practice unthinkable in traditional news broadcasts. For example, he used his own progressive voice as a concerned citizen when passionately giving his opinions on political topics, using prosodic features like high pitch, changing rate of speech, stressing words, only then to quickly switch viewpoints to give voice to other characters, often the politicians he wanted to criticize. The second rhetorical tactic, contextual clash, involves the multiplying and mixing of seemingly unconnected contexts with one another. Stewart utilized this tactic to create disparate comparisons, not only to make his discourse humorous, but also to provide political insights to the viewers. For example, when he showed a video clip of a politician saying something in a given context, but played that clip in an entirely different and sometimes absurd context, this recontextualization provided viewers with a framework for better understanding the original political message criticized by the host. The third tactic, satirical specificity, is in our view, a strategy that is used to shed light on vague ideologies in the political world through critically analyzing the words and actions of political figures. 
On the show, Stewart used humor to deflate these discursive mystifications by placing such bromide in specific contexts that are easily understandable. The data analysis of this presentation combines the theory of conceptual integration or blending and the notion of fictive interaction. Blending is based on mapping between and fusion of so-called mental spaces, conceptual domains like reality or fiction. Fictive interaction is the use of an ordinary face-to-face -face conversation frame in order to structure thought, discourse, and grammar. Fictive interaction does not involve a genuine dialogue, but one that is fictive between reality and fiction. Oops, sorry, I skipped ahead. Uh, the debate with Kant referenced in Fauconnier's and Turner's work and mentioned in so many other articles. Uh, so you have lost your slides. Oh, you lost my slides. Oops. I don't know what happened. Did that's I stop right. sharing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems that so. Um, oh, sorry. That's fine. I, I, there was a Good. glitch here. My apologies. Here we go. Are you with me again? Okay, sorry about yes. that. Yes. Okay. Um, so as I was saying, uh, this debate with Kant has been referenced in so many other works. Uh, because it's an instance of fictive interaction blends, which are the outcome of conceptually integrating a given mental space with the frame of a face-to-face -face conversation. In this frame, there are specific roles, addresser, addressee, bystanders, and message, which speakers use to actively and successfully participate in actual communication. In the debate with Kant, an America, American professor presents himself arguing with Immanuel Kant, the long deceased German philosopher, to highlight their opposing views on reason for an audience of American university students. The network of three distinct mental spaces, two of which are inputs to a third blended space, shows how elements of the two input spaces are projected to the blended space, which is the performance of a face-to-face -face debate with Kant as the professor's opponent and the students as an audience of ratified bystanders. The reason for the blend is to dramatize the flow of ideas from Kant to the professor and back using the format of an oral debate for the benefit of the students who witness Kant being argued into silence. The instance exemplifies a fictive trialogue where the modern professor's philosophical ideas are presented in opposition to those of Kant as a didactic strategy for the sake of the students. In fictive interaction blends, the interaction takes place in a current discourse space, which according to Lanneker is defined as the mental space comprising those elements and relations construed as being shared by the speaker and hearer as the basis for communication at given moment in the flow of discourse. It involves one or more fictive addressers interacting with one another or with one or more fictive addressees so as to attain some actual communicative goal in the here and now. Now, given this uh, background in terms of our literature, we chose, or our data is based on John Stewart's monologue uh, in an episode entitled, Obama, Where Art Thou?, in which the topic was the first 2012 U.S. presidential debate between Barack Obama and Mitt Romney. This was aired on the 4th of October, 2012, and this monologue lasted approximately 20 minutes. But the question is, why was it chosen? This particular episode was chosen because it clearly illustrates how John Stewart resorts to complex conceptual networks of fictitious and fictive conversations in the service of political satire. It was also chosen because it occurred in a particularly close presidential race. And according to the Commission on Presidential Debates, the first debate was the most viewed debate of the three in this close election which caused Obama to change his campaign strategy following the other debates that he had. 
Stuart creates non-actual dialogues using multiple modes of communication, setting up conceptual configurations that are somewhere between fact and fiction. Here, we have the five types of fictive interaction networks we identified in this episode. We will be analyzing them one by one. The first example, addressing a real contemporary language user in a present past reality blend, is the first time we see the host, John Stewart, talking to Obama. We're going to show you a clip, so sit back, relax, and enjoy these few seconds of the first example of the fictive interaction network of this episode. Dude, he's yelling at you, look up! <laughs> look up! What are you looking at? What are you writing that's so important? What are you doing? To oh, that's nice, all right, I don't realize. That Mr. President, are you just gonna let him roll you? It is while this clip is shown that Stewart directly addresses the president with a colloquial evocative dude. This signals a viewpoint and frame shift. This incongruity in register is funny because in a factual conversation, the host would never call the president of the United States dude. But because this is an imaginary conversation taking place on a political satire TV show, it's acceptable and adds humor. Stewart at this point is not fulfilling the role of a broadcaster, but that of the president's equal, ready to talk to him and coach him. By shifting from a neutral to a more informal register, Stewart uses the rhetorical tactic of parodic polyglossia. The intensity in his voice while the clip is running emphasizes even more his discontent with the president and his performance. Despair is heard in his plea for Obama to look up. When he shows, when he slows his rate of speech and when he utters the words, look up. Obama's gestures of looking up in the video serve as a response token in this non genuine dialogue. He heard the plea and did what he was told. There is a camera switch back to the host at the studio. In this part of the fictitious conversation, the host is looking directly into the camera, continuing his stage dialogue with Obama by asking him why he did not look Romney in the eye. Stewart's facial expression and gaze, that is his eyeballs frowned, staring into the camera as if it were Obama, as well as his hand gestures or adapters, that is vigorously and repeatedly tapping his pen on the paper in front of him, indicate exasperation. By looking into the camera, the host is not only maintaining the current discourse space, but also including the viewers as ratified listeners of this fictive interaction, making them participants as well. Satirical specificity as a rhetorical strategy is also accomplished here by Stewart, talking directly to Obama during the debate in the same space and time, and by making the supposed reason for Obama's lack of eye contact very concrete, pretending he's drawing. All of this not only creates humor, but also conveys Stewart's, Stewart's viewers his discontent with one of Obama's shortcomings in this first debate, which was criticized by all the media at that time. The current discourse space of the first fictive interaction network involves the fusion of two input spaces, a past reality space referring to the debate from the night before, and in here and now space corresponding to the actual ongoing show. This is a so-called basic communication space, comporting the viewpoint of the host and the studio audience, as well as providing a didactic center for words and gestures. This blend produces a conspicuous contextual clash where the formal and cold register of the debate merges with the hot register of a comedy show. The overall effect of this dramatized conceit is to elicit a general discontent with Obama's performance, thus qualifying as an instance of satirical specificity. Now we're going to move on to the second example. In this example, different from the first, we have Stewart addressing a real contemporary language user 
which is Obama, in a present reality fiction blend. So once again, sit back and enjoy our second example. You know, I hate to do this to you, sir. Camera three, please. <laughs> Hi, Mr. Brother. <laughs> you know, look, I know you probably dread having to spend 90 minutes debating some knucklehead from Harvard who's just gonna rrr, 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 rrr all night. <laughs> Believe me, I know. <laughs> I've been there. But you know, Mr. President, everyone has parts of their jobs that they don't like as much, but they still have to do those things if they want to keep those jobs. <laughs> This entirely imagined talk Stewart pretends to be privately having with the president fuses fiction with reality of Stewart's ongoing monologue in the here and now, where Stewart manages camera orientation. The drastic shift in rhetorical footing is made evident when Stewart directs the camera person to a different camera. This move and shift in body orientation is very common among comedians and stage actors when wanting to signal a shift from the interactional structure in the here and now, that is the television host addressing the audience, to a different one, an imagined scenario, in this case, the television host pretending to address a discourse character. Stewart first suggests a more respectable, humble, and distant relationship with the president, uttering the phrase, I hate to do this to you, sir while looking directly into the camera with a concerned look. This look is seen with his head slightly tilted, his eyebrows slightly raised and drawn up, and his lips sucked into his mouth, indicating that he's about to give the president some tough love advice. The change of stance occurs when the host cues the audience to this change in viewpoint. First, he utters the words, camera three, please, while looking directly into the camera and pointing to his right. And then he physically turns to that side to face another camera and pretends to address Obama directly. This verbal and gestural space builder sets up a new intimate blended discourse space in the here and now, where he can fictitiously talk to Obama. This allows the viewers to better conceptualize this non-actual heart-to-heart -heart as occurring live and right before their eyes while being framed in a television studio. Stewart starts the fictitious one-on-one -on -one conversation with a direct gaze to the camera lens, smiling meekly and speaking in a boyishly and nervously tone. Hi, Mr. President, with exaggeration and humility. There's a slight shift from this informal mode to a more serious business-like tone and facial expression in the words, you know, look, emphasized with stacking the papers in front of him. Here, there's a radical change in footing. Stewart now begins reprimanding the president about his debate performance, as a can for example, like a campaign advisor would do. Incongruent frames are also activated when Stewart metaminically refers to Romney through the negative vocative knucklehead, which means idiot, which cognitively clashes with from Harvard, which is an Ivy League American university. The whole fictive interaction network makes Obama's defeat even more surprising while simultaneously diminishing Romney's victory thereby not only making the piece of discourse humorous, but also revealing Stewart's core opinion of the Republican candidate to his viewers. By abruptly and explicitly turning away from his news broadcast persona to address Obama directly with the voice of an intimidated child when greeting him first and that of a concerned citizen later, Stewart is using two rhetorical tactics, parodic polyglossia, and contextual clash. The rest of the transcript shows the advice he gives him, which in turn narrows the power distance even more. Here, John Stewart is criticizing the president for not fulfilling his obligation to perform well in the debate in order to continue being the president of the United States. His criticism is personal, 
and makes Obama take responsibility for himself, as well as responsibility for those who supported him. Contextual clash as a rhetoric rhetorical tactic is seen in this incongruent situation of the President of the United States being told he didn't do well in the debate, as though he found campaigning an annoying part of his job, which in turn could cost him his office. The current discourse space of the second fictive interaction network is made up of a factual here and now, the Daily Show studio, blended with the present reality space, that is the president or President Obama running for re-election. Space and time compressions allow this blend to occur successfully with the use of multimodal features to aid in this fictitious conversation used fictively. Let us now turn to our third example, speaking for a real contemporary language user in a present reality past counterfactual blend. So now we're going to look at an entirely different setup. But before I show this clip, I would like to contextualize it first. Stewart first shows a montage of video clips of the president at the debate, giving a very long winded response to Romney but not stating that what the other candidates said was inaccurate or downright incorrect. Obama's reply is in fact so long that the moderator, Jim Lear, has to ask him to stop for which the president apologizes. After the clip, the camera switches back to the Daily Show studio with the still image of Obama at the debate shown on the top right hand side of Stewart, of Stewart on the screen. And Stewart is at his desk, not as a news broadcaster, but as a viewer of the debate, pretending to be in a state of trance, motionless, with his hands on the table in front of him, his head slightly tilted back, and a fixed, disoriented gaze upwards for a few seconds. And now I will show you the clip. You went over your time? And yet somehow managed in all that overtime to not turn and look your opponent in the eye and just mention what he said was untrue? Let me see if I can come up with a two minute answer that might have been more effective. <clears throat> liar! Lie, 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 liar! Lie, Romney, lie. Romney, lie, lie. Your time is up. Say, so shut your fat pie hole, error. I'm the commander in chief. I don't take orders from tote bag Johnny. Lie, lie, lie. Stuart maps out his response to Romney by first theatrically preparing his transformation from host to Democratic candidate using paralinguistic features, for example, clearing his throat, and body gestures, thrusting his arms out. Simultaneously, Stewart conceptually refers to the debate by turning his body to his right, assuming his Obama's position in the debate to face Romney, hence using his body as a surrogate for Obama, a material anchor for this conceptual blend. The host points to his right and looks at his wrist to conceptually represent a wristwatch and material anchor standing for the passing of time, since each candidate had been assigned for two minutes per response. Humor arises when Stewart starts accusing Romney of lying, repeating the words liar and lie loudly several times in an exaggerated and theatrical manner, while staring at his imaginary wristwatch and briefly facing the camera three times. Repeating such an accusation recasts it in a humorous way while simultaneously mocking Romney. This, rep this repetition is reminiscent of what children would say to other children who ridicule them unjustly. These character changes and paralinguistic features involve, once again, parodic polyglossy, with Jon Stewart embodying Obama or responding as a comedian. The Stuart Obama blend allows the host to develop the role a little further. He mimics Obama by glancing at his right side, looking at his wrist, 
and replying to Lear by turning to the camera and interrupting the moderator when he says, shut your fat eye hole there, thereby effectively pulling rank as president, though in a far from presidential tone. This is not only understood verbally when he says, I'm the commander in chief, I don't take orders from tote bag Johnny, but reinforced with gestures, pointing to himself while nodding his head and talking aggressively in an uncharacteristic of Obama, indeed a, a president of the United States. The current discourse space of the third fictive interaction network is made up of a factual past space, the debate in the night before, blended with the here and now, which is the daily show, and this counterfactual space where Stewart pretends to be Obama at the debate. Once again, space and time compressions allow this blend to occur successfully with the use of multimodal features that aid in this fictitious conversation used for fictive purposes. Our fourth example is quite different from the other three. To accentuate even more how terribly Obama did in the debate, the host introduces another discourse participant, Osama bin Laden, the president's worst enemy. Stewart's outrage is made manifest in a different type of fictive interaction network construed within an intricate fictitious conversation between Osama bin Laden and Obama. Just before this extract, the host refers to the left-leaning news commentator, Chris Matthews, and shows a clip on full screen of Matthews expressing obvious frustration about the president's performance in his first debate. This serves to make the point that other Obama supporters were disappointed with the Democratic candidate. The camera shifts back to Stewart at the Daily Show studio, sitting behind his desk with no images of the debate in the background, indicating that another discourse space is being created. This prepares the ground for a contrast, indeed, a contextual clash. So now we're going to view example number four. And even the people who don't like you were somewhat stunned at the poor performance. Even Osama bin Laden from the bottom of his watery grave watched and was like, that's the guy that killed me? <laughs> really? Mr. looked down at the paper all night, shot me in the face? In this example, Stewart contextualizes his viewers by looking into the camera and talking to Obama about his poor performance. This is accentuated with the scalar implicature even to introduce the new discourse participant, Osama bin Laden. In this discourse piece, Stewart wants to emphasize that everyone agreed he did not do well in the debate. Even his worst dead enemy was also surprised. The new discourse participant is not randomly chosen and serves to create another further real past space which represents one of Obama's greatest achievements during his presidency, finding and killing the world's most wanted terrorist. The host uses an embedded intersentational fictive interaction, like plus direct speech, to change the viewpoint once again. It is a space builder that prompts viewers to a new mental space and triggers a shift in viewpoint where the image of a cartoon of bin Laden in an underwater cartoon watching the debate is shown in full screen. This linguistic marker of direct speech presents a non-actual utterance and a non-information seeking question, really said by a dead alive individual in this made up reality cartoon. When Stewart takes on the voice of bin Laden, there's a blend of mixed viewpoints occurring in a counterfactual blended space. The camera switches from the image back to the Daily Show studio, where the host is looking into the camera while using prosodic features, facial expressions, and gestures to accentuate his surprise. Through this verbal and nonverbal behavior, Stewart manages multiple perspectives, ascribing mental states to a real, dead, alive individual, 
and verbalizing them while also offering his own stance on the matter. By pretending to write on a piece of paper, Stuart uses his own body as a surrogate or a material anchor in acting the counterfactual dead alive bin Laden, imitating Obama in an exaggerated and comical manner, also known as the gestural viewpoint. In this case, the gestural view point of view is a blend of mixed viewpoints, Obama's, bin Laden's, and Stewart's. It is the host who is theatrically mocking Obama's posture, gaze, and gesture, mixing it with his own perspective to criticize the president for not maintaining eye contact throughout the debate. He does this using his own voice to portray bin Laden's, a dead alive discourse character in this current discourse blended space. The contrast presented of a fictional cartoon world with a dead alive character in front of a TV set with a real person illustrates contextual clash. It not only produces humor, but it also makes viewers reflect on why the president, an active successful leader that managed to track down and kill the world's most wanted man was not able to defeat and react to his opponent in a mere debate. Stewart blends Osama bin Laden's counterfactual voice with his own, an example of parodic polyglossia, to once again advance satiric specificity. A highly competent president acting so incompetently that even his mortal foe loses respect for him. <clears throat> Contextual clash is attained through a complex blending network involving a number of completely different input spaces that are mapped and fused with each other. The current discourse space of the fourth fictive interaction network is made up of the fusion of four input spaces. The further past reality space refers to the time when Obama's administration found and killed the most wanted terrorist, Osama bin Laden and buried him in an unknown place at sea. The fictional cartoon space, which serves as a background of the scene, is the SpongeBob cartoon, a fictional underwater world featuring the fictitious character Squidward Tentacles, an ill-tempered, hostile, arrogant octopus. In the blend, Osama bin Laden is alive, but in his burial site which naturally involves a temporal integration of the past reality space in which he was alive and above water and a present reality space in which he was dead and underwater. Bin Laden and the octopus appear together watching the debate underwater on television, showing Obama in the same suit and tie he won in the debate, the past reality space. This blend is occurring in the here and now space of the Daily Show studio. I would like to now uh, show you the fifth and final uh, example that we want to present here today. Quoting a real contemporary speaker, fictively addressing another real contemporary language user in a past present reality nursery rhyme advertisement blend. Oof, this is a mouthful, I know. And it's so intricate and interesting that we needed all these words to help explain what this blend really is. The last example comes at the very end of the monologue. Stewart fictitiously talks to Obama about how he relentlessly asked his supporters to help him win the election through a large number of passionate emails he sent. Stewart quotes verbatim a few of the subject lines of these emails from Obama's campaign. He contrasts the intensity of the emails asking for active support from voters with Obama's meek performance in the debate. This sets the scene for the final plea, which I'm going to show you now in this video. I'm tempted to leave you with the wise words of a noted actor whose campaign viral video has been forwarded to my inbox 1,900 times by some of your more passionate followers. I believe it goes a little something like this. Wake the f up. I'm tempted to leave you serves as a linguistic viewpoint to direct the viewer's attention to the video 
that the host is contextualizing for them. By using the second person pronoun, the viewers adopt a point of view inside the scene. The host uses an embedded interest and intentional fictive interaction like this to change viewpoint once again. It is a space builder that prompts viewers to a new mental space and triggers a shift in viewpoint where the video of Samuel Jackson is shown in full screen. The linguistic marker of direct speech presents the utterance, wake the F up, which is said with intensity, stress to display the anger felt by the host as to President Obama's poor performance in the debate and to serve as a wake up call to do better in other debates in order to win this election. This bit is humorous due to contextual clash, the short clip from the campaign advertisement video being contextualized within Stewart's monologue. Parodic polyglossia is also involved since Stewart is letting Jackson do the talking for him. Visually, this new mental space is created with a camera angle switch from Stewart talking into the camera at the Daily Show studio to a headshot of Samuel Jackson shown in full screen with a slight zoom effect for additional emphasis. Jackson's intensity, stress, and tone of voice when uttering the phrase, wake the F up, also makes us humorous because the profanity clashes with the conventional expectations of what counts as wise words and how one would generally address a sitting president. Significantly, the message Stewart sends Obama through this complex fictive interaction blend is also the one that closes the monologue. Reframing the quotation from the campaign video heightens and amplifies Stewart's critique in the most pointed way possible. The quote further involves contextual clash in that it is construed within another complex blending network a past reality nursery rhyme advertisement blended space in a video clip of Obama's campaign. The current discourse space of the last fictive interaction network is made up of a fusion of four input spaces. The quotation belongs to a campaign video that is also in itself a complex blending network involving multiple input spaces. The campaign video was originally produced in an online video narrated by Samuel Jackson to potential voters of the 2012 election sponsored by the Liberal Federal Super PAC, the Jewish Council for Education and Research, who supported Obama and tried to re-energize his campaign and popularity, taking us back to a further past reality space. The video is set up as a nursery rhyme entitled wake the F up, in which Jackson magically appears in the homes of the elderly, young people, and other disgruntled vote voters to encourage them to start paying attention to the election, showing these people the dangers of voting re Republican and ending his visit to each house by telling its inhabitants to wake the F up. This quote is used to refer back to the president's performance in the debate, linking it to the past reality space. The current discourse space takes place in the here and now of The Daily Show to fictively tell viewers of Stewart's disappointment about Obama's performance in the debate. To conclude, our analysis is consistent with Bakhtin's idea of monologue as a dialogue, in that language is fundamentally regarded as dialogic, emerging from the interaction of those who use it even when the addresser and the addressee are the same individual engaged in inner dialogue. Humor arises from setting up non-actual interactions, using language that would be utterly inappropriate in real and genuine communicative ex exchanges with the president to communicate something that is very real and comes across as accurate. The success of The Daily Show with Jon Stewart is thus largely due to the use of these complex fictive interaction blends based on parodic polyglossia and contextual clash for purposes of properly, properly calling attention 
to the diffident, vague, and mendacious activities of discourse characters, thereby also attaining satirical specificity. By theatricalizing these fictitious conversations in his monologue, Stewart conveyed views with a force not available to mainstream broadcasters or comic, comics. Future research into the role of fictive interaction blends and humor could focus on other source, sources of political news media outlets, like social media or internet memes, analyzing verbal and nonverbal elements of humorous fictive interaction blends and the purposes they serve. Since nowadays people look for more information that is concise and easily accessed, it would be interesting to explore the importance of fictive interaction blends in these or in other political satire or news media outlets to assess their impact on different kinds of audiences. We would like to take the opportunity here today to thank Gilles Cognier's contribution to our field in our work. Thank you.